Awesome. Whew. Well, it has been a fantastic weekend, has it not, for those that have been on the retreat. For those that are just coming back, I've seen a few newcomers uh, that have been away for the summer. People are starting starting to trickle back after traveling or heading home. Uh, if you are back, welcome back to Hamilton. We are pumped that you are here. Uh, I mean that, honestly, this is an exciting time of year as people start to trickle back in. We're excited you're here. Make sure that you get connected, and uh, let's go to the next level this year if you are only back for just during the school year. All right, church. So here's the deal. We're going to we're going to dive into the Word tonight. Flip on your Bibles. You'll have them on your chairs to the Gospel of Mark. To the Gospel of Mark. Now, Mark is the third gospel in your Bible, Matthew, or sorry, second, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, second gospel. So it's basically, find the, new, the beginning of the New Testament. If you hit Matthew, just go to the left a little bit. Mark is where we're hanging out. We're going to be here for three weeks. We're kicking off a new series called Given Up. Given Up is where we're hanging out. To the right. My wife is laughing at me, um, which is usually a sign that I need to listen. <laughs> um, yeah, Mark. All right. Mark chapter 8 is where we're hanging out. Flip on over to Mark chapter 8. So this weekend, we spent a ton of time, I've spent a ton of time teaching and uh, introducing ideas and communicating things, everything ranging from governance. We went over governance stuff as a church. Believe it or not, this church is not random. We do things with intention, with integrity, and with excellence in all areas, including things like accounting. Fun fact. And uh, I lost my train of thought. Where was I going? Somebody help me out here. Anyway, yeah, so it's been an inc incredible weekend. We did a lot of teaching. A lot of ideas were communicated. But uh, the thing that we want to do tonight is we've been focusing a lot on calling and on uh, identity, who we are. We are people that are called and equipped. Now, if you missed the retreat, if you weren't there, I think you're probably feeling like you missed out on something. You did, but that's okay. We'll forgive you. Um, we still love you. You're still welcome. Uh, if this is your first time at Lyft, you're like, what on earth is this retreat thing? This sounds weird. Uh, it's awesome. We basically just spent a weekend at the camp hanging out and uh, diving into the Word and saying, Jesus, where do you want to take us as a church? Now, here's the, uh, the thing. We spent a lot of time talking about who we are as a church. We spent a lot of time talking about where we're going as a church. But the truth of it is that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about who we follow as a church. And this series that we're getting into, Given Up, is all about who we follow and what it means for us as individuals to be followers of Jesus, to be followers of the person of Jesus. You see, it's not that we just create this thing called church and off we go. The church at its center point, at its focal point, directing everything we do is the person of Jesus. And the question I want to explore in this series is, what does it mean when Jesus says, I want you to give up everything? and follow me. Why on earth would we do that? What, what about Jesus is calling us to that? What does it mean to give up everything to follow Jesus? So the series is called Given Up. We're going to be hanging out in the book of Mark next week. I'm really pumped. Kelly is bringing the word. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be good. Why don't we take a moment and pray as we get into things this evening. Jesus, we thank you that you have uh, something to say tonight. That you have a message, that you have a word out of your word. Father, I pray that we would be ready to receive it, that we would be challenged as a church. Father, I pray for those that have never opened the Bible before or never encountered it, that they would hear something new tonight. Amen. Awesome. So, the Gospels are the section of the Bible that looks back on Jesus' life. Most of the Bible by page number, does not specifically look back on the life of Jesus. Most of it is preparation to or subsequent to the life of Jesus. But the Gospels are the unique part of the Bible that looks back on Jesus' life given first-hand accounts of what happened. This is what happened. This is what Jesus said. This is what he did. So we're going to actually read right away. We're going to come out of the gate here. In Mark chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 31. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed 
but three days later he would rise from the dead. And as he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter, one of his disciples, took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples and then reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan. (laughs) I love Jesus. This is amazing. He said, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. Then, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. To give up. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. Whew. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Hmm. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is there anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in glory of his Father with the holy angels. (laughs) You see, this church is all about Jesus. If you didn't know it tonight, we are about the person of Jesus. We are about following him and saying, Jesus, what are you calling us to? What are you calling us to collectively? And what are you calling us to as individuals? And the the thing, the the number one idea I want you to walk away with tonight, if you're tired and you're, you're like, I don't know if I have a lot of room for information, here's the one idea I want you to walk away from. You are called to be a Jesus follower. And the question is, who is Jesus? If Jesus is saying, will you follow me? The question that naturally comes out of it is, Jesus, who are you? Jesus, who are you? And tonight you might have an opportunity to say, Jesus, who are you? Like, maybe you've walked in and been like, I don't know what I think about this church thing. Guys are a little bit weird. You're a little bit boisterous. You sing songs. You raise your hands. That's awkward. There's lights, there's music. I've never sung out loud before. What's with the Christian karaoke? What's going on here? And maybe the question you need to ask yourself is, Jesus, who are you? Like, honestly, who are you? What's this deal? Maybe you've been following Jesus for a long time, and the question you need to ask yourself is, Jesus, like, who are you in this area of my life? What are you saying to this area of my life? Maybe you've been follow, you have been kind of walking with Jesus and then you walked away and you're like, I don't know where I stand right now. And you're like, Jesus, uh, who are you if I haven't been talking to you? What are you like now? The question is, who is Jesus? So I'm titling, titling this message really briefly. It's kind of funny. Is would the, real, would the real Jesus please stand up? Would the real Jesus please stand up? <laughs> So there's this great interchange here. It comes to it in Mark, uh, in in verse 33. It says, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples, then reprimanded Peter. You know when Jesus is about to reprimand someone that they did something really bad? Like, he's just like, I'm dropping the hammer right now. He he says, get away from me, Satan. And he's like, this is like one of Jesus' best friends. (laughs) Get away from me, say, why? Why was Jesus so frustrated with Peter? What was going on here? You have to understand, these two were like best friends. They had walked, they had cried, they had invested into each other a great deal. And Jesus is dropping like an absolute like on him. Like you are not saying, the words coming out of your mouth right now, Peter, are not the words that need to be coming out of your mouth. The question is, why is, is Jesus being harsh? Is he being mean? Is he, is he, is he kind of like, is stepping you know, out of bounds here a little bit. We got to back up. We got to back up. In verse 29, Jesus asks Peter a question. Sometimes in our Bibles, there's these section headings. I think there's a section heading right uh, at verse 31. But it's actually a continuous stream of thought. And in verse uh, 29, there's a conversation between Peter and Jesus. And Peter says this. He says, or sorry, Jesus asks Peter this. Then he asked him, but who do you say that I am? So they're talking about, you know, they're talking about who people are saying Jesus is, and then some are saying this, and some are saying that, and, and Peter, asked, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? Honestly, well, Peter, what's your, what's your thought here, man? What, what do you think? Who do you think I am? What are we doing here? And Peter replies, you are the Messiah. You are the Messiah. So a little bit of context here. A little bit of context. The people in, in Jesus' day, especially the Jewish people, lived in the, in, under the oppression of the Roman Empire. 
And their, their longing, their desperation was to be free from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And down through, uh, the, in the previous years, there'd been a number of people that they thought were the Messiah. People that, that raised up rebellions and they fought back. And there were people that were going to free the people of Israel from tyrannical rule and, and give them freedom and set up a kingdom. And, and, and Peter was waiting for, for this Messiah, waiting for the person who would lead the charge to give them freedom. So what Peter's saying here is, you are the Messiah. You're the one that's going to give us freedom. In other words, you are the one that has been sent by God to accomplish what only God can accomplish because we're, we're stuck. That was Peter's context. But you see, that's not who the Messiah was. You see, Peter was looking for the Messiah to be a a certain thing. He wanted Jesus to be a certain thing. So when he said, you are the Messiah, which Jesus is, he meant, you are the king that's going to free me from the Roman rule. And then he turns around and, and Jesus starts to say, well, I'm going to suffer. And I'm, I'm going to die and I'm going to get beat up by the, the, ruling, the rulers of the day and I'm, I'm going to suffer many great things. And Jesus and Peter says, whoa, wait, wait a second, that's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. The Jesus I want to follow is the Jesus that sets me free from the Roman rule. But you're saying the, 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 the Messiah that I just testified about is going to die and suffer? That's, well, that's not the Messiah I want to follow. Jesus, you got it all wrong, man. Jesus, you're not the Jesus, if that's the Jesus that you're calling me to follow, that's not a Jesus I'm interested in following. You see, the problem here is that Peter was trying to jam Jesus into his perspective. He was trying to make Jesus who he wanted him to be, rather than allowing Jesus dictate who Peter should be. See, what we often do is, as people is we like to take religious figures and, 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 and context all around us and say, okay, how can I make you fit my worldview? Jesus, how can, I, how can I fit you into my nice little box here? How can I make you who I want you to be? But the problem is Jesus is in subject to any of our whims. Jesus is who he is. And he has a call in each one of us to say, would you let me, would you let who I am interact with who you are? See, the problem is that although Peter was following Jesus, in this moment he had ceased to be a follower and was trying to actually be the leader. And that's why in, in, in another translation and in the original Greek, the word that Jesus uses, get behind me. Get behind me. You are, your position, Peter, is not to lead me, but to be my, my follower. Our call as people is to be behind Jesus, to be following him, to be chasing him. And what that means is that we actually follow Jesus and allow him to speak into our life however he wants to speak into our lives. Jesus is the leader. Jesus is the director. And there's a tendency to want to jump into that position, to jump into that driver's seat and be like, I got this. I got this. I know how to lead. I, I can tell you what to do, Jesus. No, you can't. Peter had lapsed. In one moment, he was saying you're the Messiah, and the next minute, he was actually just trying to lead. And the first question we have to ask ourselves when we're asking Jesus, who are you, is are we willing to let Jesus be who Jesus is? Are we willing to let Jesus be whoever he is? Are we open to the answer that follows the question of Jesus, who are you? Or are we just going to give whatever answer we think should fit the bill? Hmm. Sometimes I think our thinking needs to shift from being the leader to being the follower of Jesus. Sometimes we intellectually allow Jesus to be the Messiah. We allow Jesus to be Lord. We intellectually say, yes, Jesus, you're Lord. But in every practical moment, actually, we're in the driver's seat. At every practical moment, we're saying, well, Jesus, I don't like who you are, so I'm just going to put you over there. You're still in charge. You can still tell me what to do. I'm just not going to listen. Right? And so Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Peter, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view not from God's. I'm just going to do a quick sec, guys. I'm going to change this mic. It's given me a nightmare of a time, probably distracting you. It's distracting me. So uh, I'm just going to switch over to this mic here. Uh, Bovin, thanks, man.
Chickity check. Oh, we're back, and it sounds great. Can we give it up for the sound team? <laughs> Turns out there's a lot of interference in this building, and our wireless mic's having a bit of a rough day at the office. That happens to the best of us. All right, so, so Jesus keeps going with Peter. He keeps going with Peter, and he comes to verse 33. And he says, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. See, because Peter was looking at it and saying, well, you need to fit this box of what I want the Messiah to be. And Jesus is saying, I don't fit in your box, Peter. I don't. I am who I am. And you can't make me who you want me to be. You see, all, G all Peter could imagine as a follower of Jesus was what he thought the Messiah was. But you see, sometimes being a follower, this is a bit of a leadership tangent for you guys, sometimes being a follower is that believing that when, they, when our leader moves, they move from a perspective that is broader and bigger than our own. Let me say it again. Sometimes being a follower means trusting that the person we are following, our leader, does so from a perspective that is bigger and broader than our own. They see something that we don't see. And you see, the problem here was that Peter could only see so far. He couldn't see the outcome. He couldn't see the road to the cross. He couldn't see reconciliation for all people to relationship with God. All he could see was that his idea of being restored and conquering and free from Roman rule was not going to work out because Jesus was going to die. Following a leader means trusting a leader to see more than we do. Peter's mistake was not just that he was confused but that his default position was that his leader was wrong. I mean, Peter's problem here was not just that he was confused about who Jesus was. His real problem was that his default position was that, well, Jesus, you've got it wrong. You're my leader, but you've got it wrong. You're my leader, but you've got it wrong. See, followers ask questions. Follow where are we going? What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Where are we going? Was that Peter's posture? No, Peter's posture was Jesus. You're nuts. Jesus, you've lost the plot. You see, the thing is that we tend to only see what is directly in front of us. We tend to only see what is directly in front of us. And all Peter could see when he looked at Jesus was, Jesus, you're painting a picture of pain and suffering. He couldn't see down the road to see the impact of the cross. And so Peter shifted his focus. He couldn't see where Jesus was going, so what did he do? He shifted his focus from Jesus down the road. Instead of looking at Jesus, he started to look at the outcome. But he didn't understand the outcome, so he stopped looking at Jesus and stopped trusting Jesus. This is why Jesus says, Peter, you're, you're seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. You see, here's the thing, church. Being a follower of Jesus means that we will not always know the outcome but it means fixing our eyes on Jesus instead of the outcome. And saying, Jesus, I'm going to trust you where you're going. I'm going to trust you where you're going. That you see something I don't see. I've got my eyes on you. I'm following after you. I'm going after you. I'm not going to be distracted by what's on the right and what's on the left. I'm not going to be distracted by my circumstances to dictate my eternity. I'm not going to be distracted by my insecurities. I'm not going to be distracted by what's over there because my eyes are on you, Jesus. My eyes are on you. I follow you. You're my leader. I follow you. I follow you. Where you're going, I'm going to go. I follow you. Oh, I don't like that. It doesn't matter. I don't like the outcome. I'm following you. Here's a story about kind of illustrating this that I've had to learn literally the very painful way. It's a cycling story. I love cycling stories. So last summer, I was at a race in... Um, Gravenhurst, I think. And uh, it was a race I was a little bit nervous about. It was a course I really didn't like. And uh, I was riding in a group. And you know, like cyclists, we ride in skinny clothes and we're skinny guys and we ride in tight packs. So we're all really close together. And uh, we're riding along and we're uh, just warming up for the race. And uh, a mountain bike race start is a little bit like just chaos on wheels. Um, the gun goes off and you pray that you don't die in the next 30 seconds. That's essentially what it feels like. It's very nerve wracking and it's not a lot of fun. Um, but I do it anyway. So, 
we're, we're warming up on the road and we're all cruising. There's about six of us, uh, my teammates and some random dude. And uh, we're just we're just pedaling along, kind of an easy pace. We've done all of our intervals to warm up and we're, we're cruising back to the start. We're literally maybe five minutes from the gun going off. Legs are nice and warm, feeling fresh. And then all of a sudden I hear like a noise to my right. And what was happening was when you ride a bike, you follow in, in close succession like this. Like I was within inches of the guy in front of me. We were just cruising. I was within inches on the right and inches on the on so like a kind of a square and then guys behind me. And I hear a noise to my right. What did I do? I turn my head. And instead of following the guy in front of me and trusting my teammate that he would figure out what to do, I, I turn my, my head to the right. Next thing I know, I am flying through the air, not, no longer connected to my bicycle, getting a really good view of my teammate underneath me. That's not a good view if you're a bike rider. And I face first into the, into the pavement. And, uh, and just the sound of carnage and bicycle wheels breaking and people and the, oh, it's not good, not a good scene. And I get up and I'm just bleeding everywhere and my teammates are all over the place and it's just a complete mess. And uh, I, ra I raced the race anyway. I'm standing there on the start line and I'm bleeding and the medical officer is asking me if I have a concussion. I'm like, no, no, I'm good, man. I'm good. Totally good. No problem. I can't see straight. <laughs> but I didn't want to get like a concussion suspension. So I was like, no, no I'm good. I'm good. And it was the worst race of my life. Uh, I was, I think, dead last because I literally couldn't pedal. You see, the problem was that my job was to follow my leader. My job was to follow my leader, but I allowed a distraction to shift me from trusting that the person in front of me can do their job, and I got derailed. And our job as Christians is to follow Jesus, to follow Jesus and not allow distractions and circumstance and things to come into our lives that shift our focus off of that. Jesus, I'm following you. I'm trusting you. Where you're going, I'm going. I don't know the outcome, but I'm following you. Let me give you a really practical example of this. You know, a minute ago I was talking about generosity, and I think sometimes our finances, unfortunately, provide a really useful illustration because they have numbers. I'm a numbers guy. And the thing with our finances is that sometimes we're like, Jesus, I, I trust you. I'm going to follow you with my finances. Oh, I got a distraction. Oh, I, I can't trust you right now with my finances because I got to deal with this issue. I know I haven't been faithful all month and I've been kind of, you know, just wasting my money and doing stupid things and I've bought, uh, you know, I went for the like extra grande, super no whip, whatever, whatever. And uh, Starbucks coffee is a waste of money. If you want to get good coffee, go to Finch Coffee. It's mint. Okay, anyway. Um, Matt approved for the record. Um, and so we, we spend, we were like, you know, I've, I've been spending my money, I've been doing things that, you know, I, I know I probably shouldn't have, I haven't been that frugal, but, oh crap, I got this problem, Jesus, you're just going to have to sit over there, I'm not going to follow, I know what you're calling me to, I know I should trust you, but I can't trust you right now, because i got to deal with this issue. And so we get distracted, we get derailed, we're like, I know I'm called to this, but I'm going to do this, because this is distracting me. See, following our leader means not allowing distractions to shift our focus, I'm like, oh, oh, I had a bad week this week. Jesus, I can't trust you with this right now. Oh, oh, I, I dropped the ball and I fell back into a pattern I've been trying to break. So Jesus, I can't spend time with you right now because I feel bad about it. No, no, following our leader means stepping and being Jesus. I'm going to stick as close to you as I can. And when we get knocked off, the, we get knocked off, we come back. Jesus, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay close to you. I'm going to stay close to you. You see, because Jesus says this in verse 34, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. This might be one of the most challenging statements that comes out of Jesus' mouth. If any of you wants to be, your, be my follower, you have to give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If we want to be people that follow Jesus, you know what the first step is? To stop following ourselves. If we want to be followers of Jesus, the first step is to stop following ourselves. You see, Jesus doesn't work in half measures. Jesus isn't interested in pieces of you or half of you. He wants all of you. But allow the significance of that to settle on you for a second. What I just said is that the creator of the universe, him who made you, who knit you together, who knows you, wants all of you. 
He doesn't want half your brain and half your attention. He wants all of it. He wants all of it. And I think the challenge is, is that each of us is clinging to little pieces of ourselves, going, well, I don't know, I'm not willing to give this piece up. I'm not willing to, to trust you with this piece. Jesus, you can have all of me, yes, all of me, but not this part of me. All of me is surrendered to you, no, except for this piece. And I think we all have pieces of our lives that we're clinging to, that we're holding to, or saying, Jesus, I can't trust you with this. I can't trust you with this. I know, I know I'm following you, but I can't trust you with this. I know you created me for life and forgiveness, but I can't trust you with this. See, the reality of following Jesus, and I think this is something that I think maybe we need to clarify as a church. The reality of being a Jesus follower is that it's costly. The reality of being Jesus, a Jesus follower is that it is extremely costly. The cost of being someone who calls himself a Christian is your life. Giving up your life. Say, Jesus, I'm going to give you my life. I give you my life. The cost is not nothing. It's everything. In a moment, I'm going to talk about grace and how grace is free, but the cost and the response to grace is everything. And what Jesus is calling us to, he's saying, will you give up what you're clinging to because I have more for you. I have greater purpose. I have greater freedom. I have greater opportunity. If you want to have life, I have it for you, but you first have to let go of what you're clinging to. We want the life of Jesus. We want the promises of Jesus, but sometimes we don't want the cost of Jesus. We want what Jesus wants, can give us. Oh, we love the verses that say, if you knock the door will be open to you. Ask for anything in my name and I will give it. But we don't like the verses that say, oh, you have to give up your own way. You have to give up everything. Now, just in case there's any confusion, Jesus isn't sitting there saying, well, you didn't give me this piece, so I'm not going to talk to you. What he's saying is, is that the fullness of relationship is found with him when we give up everything. He accepts us as we are. He takes us as we are. But he's saying, hey, I have more for you. The more you give me, the more I can work in you. The more you release to me, the more I can move in you. The cost of being a Jesus follower is a willingness to give everything up. But when we give everything up, we actually find our lives. Hmm. What have you not been willing to give up? What have you not been willing to give up? I mean, you see, I think here's what happens. We start to look and go, well, Jesus, I know you're calling me to this, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through some mental gymnastics. Who's been watching the Olympics? Man, gymnasts. Whew, those, they are legends. Not as legendary as the mountain bikers today, but, I mean, just being fair. We, so we go through these gymnastics where we contort ourselves and we twist ourselves and we, say, we try to figure out how can I go from what I'm doing to what Jesus is calling me to. Okay, well, I know it's over there, so I'm just going to do like some, some twists and some turns and some mental like crazy leaps and bounds and I'm going to arrive there. I remember when I was uh, a teenager, I used to do this with downloading music. Uh, the scriptures are clear. If, the, if there's a law, we should probably follow the law. Um, that's what the word says. Live under those that rule you. And I remember I really didn't like the idea that I was not supposed to download music. It's a trivia, it's a kind of a silly example because it's not really a problem anymore. Thank you, Spotify. Um, but it was a big problem when I was a teenager. It's like the hot topic um, that everybody talked about. And I was like firmly in the like, downloading is totally ethically okay camp. Um, maybe you don't agree with me, whatever. But what I would do is I would come up with these inane arguments that were like so convoluted. I was like, well, it benefits the little band and it, it, you know, it's just the evil corporations that aren't winning and it was some sort of like quasi-libertarian like convoluted argument. At the end of the day, it was still breaking the law and it didn't matter what my argument was. It was still illegal. And then I had convoluted ways of, well, actually, it is legal. Let me tell you, I'm a lawyer at 16. Right? So we go for these convoluted leaps and these bounds and we, we, we ignore the standard that scripture is holding us to. I remember I read a poem as a teenager. Maybe some of you have heard it. It's called The Vision. And there's a section in it that is incredibly challenging. It says this. Describing a vision of a church. It says, The vision is holiness that hurts the eyes. 
It makes children laugh and adults angry. And this is the line that I think is really difficult to live with, but incredibly memorable and challenging. It gave up the game of minimum integrity long ago to reach for the stars. It scorns at the good and strains for the best, and it is dangerously pure. See, what Jesus is saying is, will you give up? Will you quit the mental gymnastics and trying to figure it out? And will you just trust the standard that I am calling you to? Because when you follow me, there's life and there is goodness and there's opportunity. <laughs> Giving up means allowing the plans and purposes of Jesus to actually dictate our behavior, to dictate our thinking. Jesus, I trust you because you're my leader. I trust you because you're my leader. I know that there's been times where the leaders in my life have called me to things that I don't like. I'm going, I don't like what you're calling me to. I don't like the standard that you're calling me to. But you're my leader, so I'm going to trust you. Jesus is saying, will you give up your life? Will you be willing to give up? Will you be willing to even follow me to things that will be painful? Will you be willing to follow me and bear this cross? Bearing a cross literally meant carrying the cross for the murderer. What they used to do is they used to uh, execute people via crucifixion, but normally they would beat them before they actually executed them. So what they would have to do is find somebody else to carry the cross. This actually happened to exactly Jesus. There was a man that was recruited to carry Jesus' cross because he was unable to. So when Jesus invites us to carry the cross, he's inviting us to suffer along with him, to give up things to the point of pain. Are we willing to give up our comfort and follow Jesus? Maybe, it, maybe it's a simple thing, like giving up our comfort of being surrounded by people that we know and engaging with a newcomer at church. It's like, hey, how's it going? My name's Bill. Fred, Jim, James, Susan. Maybe it means giving up your comfort of, of the familiar and stepping out and helping at Kelly's Simple Church sometime, handing out backpacks. They're handing out 150 backpacks on Tuesday to some kids downtown. It is amazing. A quick shout out on that. You can still jump in and support the backpacks. Liftchurch.ca slash send 20. 20 bucks for a backpack in a needy neighborhood here in Hamilton. It's going down on Tuesday. Help us make it happen. Advert over. For real though. But are we willing to engage where we feel uncomfortable? Are we willing to bear our cross to that opportunity? Are we willing to bear our cross and say, okay, I'm going to actually show up and serve with excellence and with passion and with dignity and with integrity? Are we willing to say, give up the areas of our life where it's not been in alignment with Jesus' purpose? But doing so is going to mean maybe not being able to interact with the social group we roll in as much. Or maybe being judged by them. Or maybe them being like, why are you so different all of a sudden, dude? Like, well, um, Jesus. It's amazing when we are honest about why we live the way we live. I've never had somebody be like, lame Christians. You see, the world around us is inspired by people that live with integrity. Because the, world, the standard of the world around us is not one of integrity, and it is not one of sacrifice. It is one of the easy road. And as Christians, we are called to the most difficult road, the road of giving up everything to follow Jesus. And it's amazing when people discover that we are actually willing to give up anything and live according to the standards of Jesus, the response isn't, ah. the response is, tell me more. When I was a first year at university, I was, uh, uh, I was this weird thing called straight edge. It was like this hardcore thing, uh, if anyone remembers it. Anyway, um, I used to draw X's on my hands in like big black ink to indicate that even though I was 19, I was still not drinking. Um, it was this kind of this like rebellious, not rebellious thing. Um, I wear bandanas and uh, I would fall asleep with my hand on my face uh, between classes in first year and then go to class with like an X on my face. <laughs> I was a precious kid. Um, <laughs> but the funny thing is, it only created opportunity for me. The number of people that were like, wow, Robin's actually, he's not a tool about it. He's not saying, you must live this way. I'm just saying, look, like, this is what I feel Jesus has called me to. And when we start living with integrity, it's incredible because people start to be like, why? Why are you different? Why do you live this way? What is, why on earth would you, would you give up something easy or convenient or pleasurable or attractive 
and, and suffer? Well, because Jesus calls me to. And I believe that when I follow him, it actually gives me life. Can you believe that actually in suffering there is more joy than there is in the easy road? If you try to hang on to your life, verse 35, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. You see, this church is the upside down logic of the kingdom of God. Is that actually when we cling to our lives and we say, it's my life, God, I'm not going to trust you with it. You can't have it. I know you're calling me, but you can't have it. You know what we get? We get nothing. We lose our lives. But actually, the crazy logic is that when we give up our lives, we actually start to discover it. We start to discover that we are made for more. We are made for purpose. The reality is, is that freedom is found in Jesus. Because in Jesus, when we give up our life, he is now able to start to move. It's amazing when we start to give up our lives, what we're actually doing is creating space for the creator of the universe to start to dictate what happens in our day to day. When we say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with this part of my life, we're creating room in that part of our life for Jesus to move, for Jesus to do what he wants to do. My wife said something in a session this morning that I thought was brilliant, not just because she's my wife. She said, if you want to create capacity in your life, start by serving someone. Wow. If you want to create capacity, if you want to create room in your life, start by serving someone. If you want to create room and capacity in your life for the incredible life that God has called you to, start by giving it up. Giving it up and say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you with this. Jesus, I'm going to serve. Jesus, I'm going to... The logic is upside down. Because God's logic is given from God's perspective. And what we tend to do is we tend to dictate our lives based on, I see this, so I'm going to do this. That road doesn't make sense. I know, Jesus, what you're saying, but it doesn't make sense, so I'm going to go on this road. But part of being a Jesus follower means trusting him when the road doesn't make sense. See, many of us continue to try to find life within ourselves. Uh, I think I can find life if I just, if I just, you know, if I just work more. As somebody that has worked insane hours, I can tell you that life is not found in working more. I've done the 160 hour weeks. How many hours are in a day? Or in a week? I don't know. I've done that many hours of work in a week. I went through a season where for a year almost I would work from 7 a.m. till midnight every day without stopping in the hopes of seeing a, a little software startup make it and make it big. And you know what? We still haven't made it big. We're six years in and we're still not there. Throwing yourself in work, yeah, maybe you might get some reward, but it's not going to produce it. Some of us throw ourselves into the, into like, well, how can I just get the most fun out of every day? Jesus, I, I, I'm not interested with you. I'm just interested in the most fun because fun is what I'm going to chase after. I think there's other, chance, other, other opportunities where, and I think this, this breaks my heart, where we've given up searching for purpose and meaning and joy in life, and we actually have just res, kind of set back and said, I'm just going to do the easy way. I'm just not even going to search for meaning and purpose. I'm just going to float through life mediocre. And you know what? I do not believe that you were made for mediocre. I do not believe that when Jesus creates, he creates mediocre. Because when I look at, around, at the world around me, I don't see mediocre. I see glorious and wonderful. This, the word says that all creation testifies to the glory of God. What about your life? See, I believe that your life was designed to testify to the glory of God. And yet we live lives that are so small because we're so trying to control what we can hold in our hands. And Jesus is saying, if you're willing to give it up, I can give you so much more. I can give you life that will testify to my glory. Imagine that our lives can actually reflect back on God's glory. See, our life is found when we give it up. When we give it up. When we give it up. And as we give and as we trust and as we follow Jesus, He starts to move and He starts to pour in and He starts to leave. And He starts to take hopelessness and transform it into joy. And He starts to take despair and turn it into hope. 
He starts to take the things that we think that there is no possible way out of and he creates a way. We cease to be a people constantly in the search for more and we start to live in the more right now. Is that going to be easy? No. Is it going to be painful? Yes. But we are called to give up our lives and find life in Him. When I was nine years old, I gave my life to Jesus. I'm like, how could a nine-year-old do that? I don't know. But I did. Sometimes God starts to move in our hearts and He starts to draw us in. And we start to have an awareness that we were actually made for more, that we were made for relationship, that we were made for purpose. And so at nine, I, I said, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. My parents tried to talk me out of it because they're like, this kid is crazy. And I was like, no, I'm for real. I want to follow Jesus. And over the years, I've, I've had seasons where I've followed him well and seasons where I've not done well at sticking close behind him. Especially when I was a new kid in Canada from South Africa. Man, that was a tough season. But as I have continually said, Jesus, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to stick close to you. Yeah, I've, I've taken a step off sometimes. And yeah, I've made mistakes. But I'm going to stick close to you. I'm going to stick close to you. You know what? He has filled me with such life and such joy and such purpose that I'm... I read this verse and I say, yes, Lord. Come on, I want to give you my life, Jesus. And some of us have been following Jesus for our whole lives, but yet we're still clinging to our lives. We've stepped into the grace of Jesus where we're saved, but we're not actually walking in the freedom of Jesus as people that are free. You were not made just to know about Jesus and testify that he is Lord. You were made to walk in the freedom of the life that he created you for. We were not made for the safe, the familiar, or the easy. We were not made for our way. We were made to trust a leader, to trust Jesus. Say, so you created me, Lord. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to get behind you. I'm tired of following my way. I'm tired of clinging to my pieces. I'm going to follow you, Lord. And bow our heads tonight as we wrap up. If that's you tonight, you're saying, you know what, Robin, you're right. I've been following, I gave my life to Jesus, I said yes to Jesus at some point in the past, but I haven't been willing to trust Him with my life. And I feel like I've been living only in half of what God has for me. If that's you tonight, why don't you throw up your hand? No one's watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just up, you can put it down. Jesus, I pray for those that have said, hey, I, Jesus, I, I follow you, but I've been following you from a distance. I've been following you. I follow you, but I'm not willing to trust you. Father, I pray for those that have lifted their hands, and I pray that there would be a new trust that they can place in you. God, that in every area of their life that they would learn to walk in the freedom and in the joy and in the trust of you, knowing that you have created them for more. For more goodness. For more hope and more joy and more purpose. Jesus, that that would be their reality. That they would stick close to you. That they would follow you that they would be as close to you as possible, that their feet would be right on yours. That they would be giving, willing to give up anything that's hard, holding them back, that their very lives would be offered unto you, Jesus. see before I close tonight, if there's anyone in the room tonight that said, you know, I've never even said yes to following Jesus before. I've heard about him a little bit, but I've never actually said yes to following him. If that's you tonight, why don't you raise your hand and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus tonight. Yeah. Is anyone tonight that said, yeah, I want to, I've been living 
living in my own way. I've been living in my own kind of stuck process. And I've been searching and not finding. And tonight I want to say, yeah, I want to, I want to explore something with you, Jesus. I want to explore a relationship with you. I want to explore trusting you. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. No one's looking. Yeah. Yeah. I see that. Jesus, I pray for those that have raised their hands. If you raise your hand, why don't you pray with me tonight? Jesus, I know that you have created me for more. I know that you have created me for more than my own way. Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to give you my life. I want to trust you. So I give you my life, Lord. Help me to follow you. Help me to walk in your freedom. Amen. Awesome. Can we give it up tonight for the Lord and what Jesus is doing in this place? Yeah. When we stand to our feet as I send you guys out. Jesus, I thank you for this church and the work that you are doing. Father, that you are gonna, you are working towards something new and fresh, and a great thing is happening in this church as we raise, as we see leaders raised up and people coming to know you. But I, Father, I pray above and beyond anything that you're doing in this church, that each person here would be a person that is following after you and willing to give you their life. That this week, the areas of our life that are not surrendered to you would be surrendered to you, Jesus. Whatever it is, and however tight we cling to it, God, break our grip and help us to trust you. Amen. Awesome. Thanks for being in the house tonight, church. It's good to be here. Next week, we're back in the second week of the series. Kelly's going to be preaching. It's going to be awesome. If you lifted your hand tonight and you said, yeah, I, I want to respond to that. Why don't you stay back for prayer? There'll be a bunch of people available to pray with you. I'll be here. I'll be hanging around at the front. Otherwise, be blessed, church. Have a fantastic week, and we will see you soon. Let's give it up one more time for what Jesus is doing in his church. Have a great week.